this discussion today. So we have with us Roxana Lorraine Witt, who is from um, Save Space. Um, if you could just give us a wave so we know who you are. Roxana? Yeah. Hi. Hello, everybody. Nice, um, nice to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we also have Nadia, Nadia Asri from the International Falcon Movement. Hello, Nadia. Hello. And we do have with us Nana, Nana Asante um, from ID Pad UK. But I think we're having slight technical issues. So I hope she'll be able to join in the conversation. Um, if not, we can hopefully hear from her another time. But um, yes, as I was saying, this is the fourth um, online discussion, and we're continuing our discussion on. Um, what Black Lives Matters means for Europe. And, um, <laughs> and to, today we're actually moving the discussion on a little bit. We've had a discussion on you know, people's initial thoughts and experiences after the George Floyd murder in the US. Um, we've had uh, more discussions on police brutality across Europe and also the Black Lives Matters uprising across Europe. And um, this week, again, we're going to build on the discussions and we're going to talk about um, how different racialized groups are ex experiencing police brutality. We're also going to talk about um, the colonial legacy and the police and briefly touch upon kind of decolonial strategies. And um, again, we're going to talk about potential solutions. What can we do um, as anti-racist organizations, as organizations working with different minority groups? So this is the, the kind of context for the discussion today. And I'm going to start with a, a, a question to Roxana. Um, if you're, if I can still Somehow your video has gone off. Okay, Roxana, you're, you're with us. So the question to you is, to what extent is police brutality targeting Roma people? So thank you so much, Ajiku, for this very important question. So we have to go a little bit back in history to um, how far police brutality is attacking many people. Roma and Sinti people have been charges of special registration ever since the uh, since the uh, national socialist can you see me and can you hear me sorry so ever since uh, the third right we have been charges of special registration and while nowadays it is prohibited in germany to register the ethical group of a uh, criminal still in criminal records we find uh, shortcuts which clearly identify people who are, have been targets of police as Roma or Sinti people. Although it is illegal, just last year we had this big scandal of the Berlin police where the German Council of uh, Sinti and Roma um, got involved into talks, but this is not the end. Like, we have been talking and talking for decades how Roma and Sinti people all over Europe have been of police brutality and violence, yet during the COVID-19 crisis, we can clearly see videos circulating around social media of people all over Europe belonging to the minority become targets of violence from police officers, unfortunately, while they are usually the ones who should protect the constitution and the democratic rights and values we can often recognize that they are the ones breaking the law, actually. And even here in Germany, where we are ha having a very privileged position amongst the European countries as being recognized as a presumably right country and first world industry nation, we still have cases of Roma people being assembled in COVID-19 crisis because they are Roma. They have a, a prohibition of going out, even though they are not um, they are not tested positive for COVID-19. And um, there are two two um, cases of this going on in Göttingen. There is there's a um, 
Yeah, Roma settlement, a bigger settlement where a lot of Romani people live. It's not exclusively Romani people living there, and they are uh, facing a lot of um, violence right now. And uh, which we are still testing if this is for what is going on there because they are prohibited from going out. They are a of people who are sick, although a lot of people of them, elderly people and uh, fans, uh, are not tested positive are, and are among the risk groups. So this is how people are targeted not only in Germany but all over Europe. And just today I have had the... Um, the um, sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm out of my order. I have just read the report Amnesty International saying that what is happening here in Göttingen and in Berlin with Romani groups, that they are assembled and unholy prohibited from going out even while they are not tested positive. Uh, even, uh, just in this manner, in all over Europe, Roma groups are facing the same behavior from police uh, enforcement. That they are assembled and they are, uh, that they are facing uh, unnecessary violence and brutality from police because they are seen as spreaders of, um, of illness, you know, of sickness. They are seen as parasites, they are very upfront. And I think this is very problematic and there is a lot of similarities uh, of the violence that their black community is uh, facing in centuries uh, and other groups like the Romani people and uh, not only the Romani people and the black people but a lot of other minorities that are being treated unrightfully. Thank you for that um, kind of introduction to the police brutality that's targeting Roma. I think that's really interesting what, you, what you're saying and also to, to kind of highlight the Amnesty International report that came out last, last week, which was really like a, a good example of how Roma are targeted by the police and by uh, government institutions in a and I would describe as a quite violent way. So not just in like kind of a physical brutality, but this kind of way in which Roma settlements and people are not allowed to move. So it's very much linked to this whole uh, crisis around COVID and this pandemic and the restriction of movement in Roma settlements is really problematic and is another form of violence, or at least you know, uh, restriction on freedom of movement. So I think that this is um, something that is, is really important that we discuss. And I, just a quick follow-up question really is like, do you feel that this, the issue of police brutality is, is discussed um, enough in the public sphere, Roxana? Very upfront, I'm speaking here from a privileged position in Germany. I don't think so. First of all, because we are in a privileged position, the century from a living in Germany anyway. But still, like the whole discourse right now, to be honest, it's revolving around how the police in Germany is guilty accused of similarities. With, like you know, the argumentation follows like that. They are saying, okay, maybe in America this is happening, and in other places of Europe, but not in Germany. While in Germany it is happening, you know, and they are even high um, poli politicians who are in high positions who are saying you need to defend our police for being falsely accused. You know, there is a, a, a victim perpetrator um, exchange, right? You know, the people who are perpetrated by the police, you know, they are overlooked and, uh, you know, even accused of being doing something wrong to the police by bringing all the violence into the discussion. But we need to discuss it. We need to discuss it here as we need to discuss it globally. Like, I think, I don't know any country where the police is not doing wrongfully towards minorities. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Nadia, I want to, to go on to a question to you, because we're obviously we're talking about the police, and it's like, there is a link to kind of like colonial history and the, and policing. And I just wondered if you had something to say on how um, the police service is instituted in a colonial way. Hi, yeah, thank you very much for having me um, to speak today. I think in order to kind of think about and understand the police services in a colonial institution, it's quite helpful to think about the kind of the white supremacist capitalist world order as a jigsaw. 
and racism is a kind of piece in that jigsaw puzzle um, and as a system that is is perpetuated by different institutions, one of those institutions being the police force. Um, I think if we look at the history of the police force, we see that it's kind of emerged in tandem with the colonial concept of civilization and policing has emerged to maintain order within that idea of civilization and that civilization at the time and I mean, continues to be a very kind of white supremacist idea where everything closest to whiteness is order and everything that deviates from that is disorder. So I think that if we think about the police, which well, yeah, which emerged in tandem, we think about how they're, all, they're authorised and equipped with different technologies of violence to maintain that order. But we think about the fact that these authorised and organised authorised and organised technologies of violence is rooted within white supremacy and is rooted within this idea that black and brown bodies are immoral. And I think that was that that kind of emerged at the time, but that continues that continues that that idea continues to exist in our imagination. We have an assumption of racialized bodies, but I want to say specifically black bodies being 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 threatening, being dangerous, and being and needing control, and so it justifies the way that the police acts upon them. And I think that if we take, for example, like the example of George Floyd, I think, and the, the instance of violence that was that was used by but in that in that situation, that it's very easy to think about the fact that the the man who murdered George Floyd is a racist. The man who murdered George Floyd is um, a white supremacist or a bad apple in the police force. But that actually kind of detracts from the fact that the state murdered George Floyd. The state murdered George Floyd. We need to think about the interlocking policies that justify hyper-policing. We need to think about the different, the different physical the different physical acts of violence that 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 escalated that situation but we also need to think about the different systems that are in place alongside the police force to and the different institutions that 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 perpetuate racism and that that justify and maintain that that kind of white supremacist colonial word order yeah absolutely and i think that this is exactly like leads on to my next question around kind of like institutions because obviously we're talking about the police as an institution we 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 often talk about um institutional racism um but there's also institutions other institutions like the education system as well and this kind of leads me on to my next question because we as organizations working in anti-racism or working with minorities understand and are aware of these colonial histories and how it impacts on on us but it's not necessarily part of a formal education so I was just wondering like you know a lot of people are talking about how to decolonize um, our, our public spaces our streets etc I wonder if there's a role for non-formal education in this whole discussion, Nadia, and if you have something that you can share with us on this. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Thank you. I think that non-formal education is key. I think that to move to 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 move beyond um, institutional racial racism, structural racism, and systemic racism, we really need to we, we need capital investment in radical community powered institutions that can serve as alternatives to the institutions that already exist. So I think I'd firstly like to start by speaking a little bit about examining ed like the education system as an institution that perpetuates racism. I think that we often think about in teachers exist kind of in public imagination and in the state's imagination as kind of soft, as nurturing, as empowering, as wanting to help. But I think that we need to problematize that image that we have of teachers. And we need to we need to understand teaching as a profession and teachers as people who are who are socialized and conditioned in the same way as as people who 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 see racialized bodies as threatening and as dangerous, and particularly black bodies. I think that we need to think about the role that teachers have in reproducing and upholding the system. And, and to do that, we look at, for example, extremely high expulsion rates of, of um, Romani students and of black students. We look at the racial attainment gap. Uh, I can speak about the UK, the racial attainment gap that emerges in education from primary school when we first start introducing standardised testing. And I think that the teacher's role in, in the system is to produce kind of, produce people who are going to who are going to play their role in the system. And, and so I think that we need to think about that firstly, and we need to problematize that. And secondly, I think that we need to problematize 
the way that knowledge from the academy, from from academic institutions and universities and higher education in, uh, institutions, are that knowledge continues to be leading in anti-racist narratives. I think that the fact that we we still somewhat consider the academy as the sole legitimate site of knowledge production is al- aligns us with white supremacy because we're using the very ivory tower that 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 create that created the knowledge that oppresses us and that exploits us to to fight to fight racism. And I don't think necessarily that's the way that's the way we should do it. I think that it's an embodiment and imp- and, a, and, a, and a perpetuation of the system. So I think that non formal education is can play a really really important role i think that it can it can encourage we can we can use it to understand racism and we can use it to encourage a structured effort to change it rather than just using a a resistance that the state can accommodate a narrative that the state can accommodate a way of a way of resisting that the state can accommodate so i think that with non-formal education different i think that different methods like community education and peer education where we get people together to speak about their observations to speak about their experiences to speak about the generational and ancestral knowledge that they pass through and I think that we can harness the very the very attributes that children are demonized for within the state education system to empower them to make them feel as though they have power to think about different ways that we can bring about change and what we need what we need for that and what we need for non-formal education to be successful is 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 capital investment i think in in that form of in that form of of, of learning i think that's very key i can't hear you sorry I was on mute, but um, yeah, I'm super, thank you very much for that, um, uh, covering um, formal and non-formal education and what we what we need to kind of look at. I'm really super aware that Nana is uh, trying to join us in this discussion. And I'm just wondering, Nana, are you, can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, wow, I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what I did was I dialed in, thanks to Ezra's support, so thank you to Ezra. But I don't know what's happening with my connection. I can hear you, your, although sometimes the picture goes, so I think it's my internet connection. So I've dialed in. Well, congratulations. I'm so happy that you're here. And perfect timing, because the next question is going to go to you. And essentially, you know, we've been talking about, of course, you know, you've been listening to this uh, this series of discussions. We're talking about police brutality. Um, yeah. what, what what Black Lives Matters means in Europe. And um, we're talking about kind of like decolonial strategies and how we can think about moving forward. So the question I have to you is that we've seen with the kind of um, Black Lives Matters protests and uprisings, how um, put, kind of putting down the statues or um, defacing the statues in some ways has become really um, a key feature of the uprising. And um, a question that we've had is like, how do we move um, the kind of movement um, from just the focus on these statues, and I think it's a good focus, but um, to something more political. How do we move that into a kind of political demand for some sort of system change along the lines of what Nadia was talking about, really? So I wondered if you had something to say on that, um, Nana. Um, well, I do. I'll actually say that the, uh, I suppose the statues, removing the statues is a political statement. It is about symbolism. And I think sometimes we, because, okay, I like policy documents and I like change because I was an elected member of the council. I like change through that method. But I recognize that sometimes um, the way in which uh, the the racist language is unheard. So the way people express themselves can be quite different. Certain statues are symbols. And it's quite interesting that before this new move, there was the whole Roads Up Fall movement. At universities up in um, Britain, people were saying, look, we need to decolonize the curriculum. We need to change the way things are done. Remember, statues are a symbol of power, a symbol of honoring. What, why are they honoring these people? So Colston, for example, was a philanthropist. Yes, that's beautiful. But he was also a slave trader, or rather a trafficker in human beings. And just as we wouldn't put a statue to Hitler, even though he made, he brought the, the Volkswagen, he gave people full employment, we wouldn't tolerate a statue of him. In a sense, that's what we're saying. You shouldn't be tolerating a statue of any of these people. 
And what is happening is, for the first time, I think Britain is having a discussion about whether these statues represent history. Are we trying to rewrite history? Or are we correcting the narrative? The narrative has been quite, um, how would I say, it has only been partial. We've only heard part of the story. What we hear is about Britannia rules the waves, the sun will never set over the British Empire. We forget that as the joke goes, it's because God didn't trust them in the dark. So it's about the real story of empire. So to me, this, we should recognize it as a political statement and then work with the movement, channel it into maybe more fundamental change. It is interesting that the King of Belgium has apologized to the president of the DRC, or let me correct it, he didn't apologize, he's expressed deep regret. And it's funny how people choose words. Tony Blair didn't want to apologize either. It was about regret. What is so wrong with apologizing? Recognizing the fault, and then we all move on together. You know, in criminal matters, we have what we call restorative justice. So just as there's reparation, there's also restorative justice, where the victim and the perpetrator come together, and we have a discussion. And that discussion is also about recognizing the harm that's been done. We can't just move on and pretend it never happened. If you look at it, um, Belgium, or rather King Leopold, controlled the Congo from, 19, uh, from um, 1885 to 1908. 23 years, 23 years where there was mayhem and, you know, it was horrible. Sometimes we all shy away from talking about it, uh, you know, mutilating people, killing, raping, all that kind of thing went with colonialism and uh, trafficking of Africans and enslavement. So to me, the political statement of removing the statue or demanding that they be removed, and in fact, in Bristol, and it doesn't it hasn't come much on the news, what happened was the community for many years was just asking for a plaque to explain who Colston was in full. Not just that he was a member of parliament, not just that he was a philanthropist, but also that he was a trafficker in human beings and that he participated in this thing that we're now calling a crime against humanity. So it's about all of this. We need the whole history of the world. We're now a global village. We can't pretend that some of the crimes weren't really crimes. Why? So for me, that is something that we need to actually take into account. It is a political movement, and it's for us who are policy makers or people who influence policy to sort of write it up and channel it in a certain way. The people on the street are letting their voices be heard. And I don't think we should, in my view, because there's a lot of discussion in the UK about, oh, we're going to put them in prison, in the States, the same thing. How can they vandalize? It is their way of expressing something that has been fundamentally wrong. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it, it did. I mean, I think that, that it's that I think what you're saying is that it's more than just a symbolic, it's actually part of the, the kind of demand for change. It's It should be seen as part of a political um, demand for, for a system change. And I think that... Um, yeah, and it's it's interesting when you when you talk about what happened in Bristol because I was I was also doing some some research a little bit about it and there was quite a long it was like I think in the 1990s that people were calling for that um, statue um, of Colston to be removed um, so it was decades and decades and decades of a a kind of like political kind of a, a request a polite political request to the local authority to 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 to, to kind of um, acknowledge that this person maybe shouldn't be um um venerated oh, in yeah. such a way so and then it just gets to a point where people are like well you know actually we're just going to take it down <laughs> we're just going to remove it and i think it is it is it is symbolic but it's also it's quite powerful um so yes you did definitely answer my question and i think it's kind of hard to move to the next question um, seamlessly, but I think what we're trying to do with this online discussion is try and think of ways in which we can um, imagine how Black Lives Matters might might be a, a broad umbrella um, for all minority groups to kind of identify under. But maybe this is a question which is um, is not easy to answer, but I think... Um, I will go to you, Roxana, to, to ask if, um, you know, how is it possible for us to 
all minorities that might be victims of police brutality kind of um, use this Black Lives Matters um, momentum? Well, thank you for asking this, because I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to stop thinking in categories that are not intersectional. Maybe today I'm sitting here and I'm very white passing, but just two weeks ago I was demonstrating against the removal of the Sinti and Roma Memorial together with Sinti Tsa, who is also a black woman. You know, and while I'm talking about this black Sinti Tsa, we also have Samuel Mago, who is part Jewish and part Roma. So first thing is we need to start thinking in intersectional categories because people are not having only one identity. People are black and Jewish, people are Roma and Sinti, people are being queer, trans, people, disabled people who are black and of Roma descent. You know, there is a conglomerate of people who are not only represented by one community, but by many communities. And what we're talking about, I'm so grateful for uh, the other speakers already mentioning it living in a system of white supremacy and we only can overcome the system of white supremacy together because it is affecting all of us together we are always talking about minorities but my personal view on this is we are not the minority we are the majority the majority is affected by a dictatorship a very small group who is profiting from this very very broad system of injustice and it's not i can agree 100 percent with the thought of need education, we do not need only non education on this. We need mandatory anti-racist education. I don't know how many years we still to wait and uh, be satisfied with symbols because I don't think it's possible to uh, bring down all of those statures of colonialists who have enslaved people for hundreds of years. This is justice. This is justice being served because those people are murders. We have statues of murder or street. And we have people with a mentality who are proof of these murders and who think this is important history on the streets. We have it in our parliament. These people have been socialized in a racist way. Nobody is talking about that. We are always talking, okay, what can we do to have Burma people to integration of black people, Jewish people, whatever. But you know what? We are not the pro not people are the problem. Romani people are not the problem. Jewish people are not the problem. Minorities, no, minorities are not the problem. The problem is the mentality of the white people who are socialized in a racist way and who are making laws and who are making all of our lives miserable. Starting from the police, going to parliament, and I'm done with this. I don't want any more funding of small projects that will not help any of us. I want big ass money for all of those institutions to get the racism out of their head. And we will only achieve this is the people who are making policies and large, not only vote in favor of all of our groups, all of the groups together because we are all affected by this, but when they go home and start teaching their children to not be racist, when they are going home and see a black person being beaten by the police and they threw their own body in, in this fight to save us and to protect us because this is what is their responsibility. And I think this is all of our fight of our uh, aim together of all groups that are affected by the system of racial injustice uh, that we can um, come closer to a reality where we are not anymore experiencing violence and brutality on the basis because this is what we are experiencing. Everybody of us, you, me, everybody here, everybody watching, we are experiencing violence on a daily basis, we traumatizing every, every single day and this needs to end. Yeah, um, you actually covered quite a lot in, in, in that answer there. Also coming to maybe some of the solutions that I think we'll we'll touch upon a, a little bit later. But Nadia, I wanted to just quickly ask you if you had any thoughts about the idea of Black Lives Matters and, and how others identify un, uh, under this banner. Hi, yeah. Um, I wanted a little, build a little bit on what Roxana was talking about, about intersectionality. But firstly, I'd like to say that I think Black Lives Matter is a really, the mo it's, it's not really an organisation, it's a movement. Um, and I think that there are lots of different, there's a lot of space within that movement for a lot of different types of resistance, which I think is really cool. Um, and I think that it's also an opportunity for racialized communities to reappraise what racism is and its role. 
But I think that a very key point, and this is kind of building on the intersectionality part, is that we view the movement and and what what we're struggling for for in an intersectional way. And to do that, we need to understand that anti-blackness is pervasive in communities of colour across the world, in Asia, in North Africa, in Latin America. And I think that that is that is that is an understanding that we that's. That's an an assumption that we have to make before we start thinking about solidarity and about how other racialized communities can offer solidarity um, to to, to the the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think that what's key in understanding this here is that the anti-blackness, the colorism that, that is pervasive in these communities all stems from a point of white supremacy. And I think that we need to recognize that and we need to offer our solidarity and, and offer solidarity to black communities and understand that it's different and it's okay that the, the, the struggle is different and the solutions are different and that's okay and that we can still stand in solidarity and we can still create spaces with our bodies, with our minds for the, for, for these for these communities. And I think that that's, that's the kind of the key assumption that we need to start with before we can try to think about how Black Lives Matter can be used to as an umbrella movement for other racialized communities, if that makes sense. That makes um, absolute perfect sense. And actually, really, thank you for kind of like um, uh, breaking that down a little bit and uh, talking about how we need to acknowledge um, anti-Black racism, not just in terms of, uh, you know, um, white versus Black, but in within other racialized communities as well. I think that's really important. Nana, are you, are you still with us? I am. Great. Um, yeah. I wanted um, to... My... Yeah, Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that um, this idea of coming together, in a way, we are actually already together. Black Lives Matter and the movement they started, and I like the, that uh, description of the movement, it has already united the world. Globally, we've had people spontaneously coming out on the street and saying, yes, Black Lives Matter. And and then, of course, you've had the report from white supremacists saying all lives matter. That's an oxymoron. What all lives matter? And Black Lives Matter is simply saying, we're reminding you that all this attack, this rape, this Afrophobia, because at the end of the day, what was happening in America was against an African American. It's Afrophobia, attacking people because of the African heritage. And it says that this Afrophobia has to stop. So when we say Black Lives Matter, yes, it means that the Roma can get under the banner because they are also suffering attack. It means Jews can get under the banner, they are also suffering attack. And I noticed that, for example, when Black Lives Matter as an organization or movement came out to say that Palestinian lives matter, they then start getting an attack as if they are yeah. suddenly anti Semitism. The good thing about Black Lives Matter and the whole movement. It allows us to have these discussions. It cannot be anti-Semitic to say that Palestinian lives matter. What we're saying is all lives matter. If there is any injustice, any oppression, whichever way it is, whoever is doing it, we need to be able to call it out. And I think that is the wonderful thing about this movement at this time. And I've been pondering why there was this reaction to George Floyd. Because when you think of it, we've had murders captured on camera. Police brutality has been captured on camera years and years and years. But why did this particular death, this particular murder, outrage the world in such a way? And I think it's a mixture of the pandemic, our being put in and the lockdown, the concentration suddenly of the message, and people suddenly having to confront the idea that a policeman who's there to protect and serve could act in such a vile manner. But we need to remember that uh, the police are an organ of state. They cannot act like this unless in a way the state sanctions it. So it isn't the words that people say, it isn't the words that our government says, it's the actions into place. Because a lot of us have been talking about institutional and structural racism for years and years. What Black Lives Matter has done is to bring it out in the open. And it's there for everybody to see and you're seeing the reaction against it, it's not that bad. Europe started by saying it's not that bad in Europe. And it took activists to remind them that we have been campaigning for years about the kind of attack that communities are suffering. I know that in the UK, we've got the Friends and Family uh, movement, and that's a movement yeah. for people who uh, relatives have died in custody. And the custody at the hand of state violence, and it's just that the police, it's migration, 
it's um, mental health, it's anywhere where the state seems to have power. They seem to misuse it and abuse it. And it is movements like ENA or organizations like ENA, activists like ourselves, who stand up and say, enough is enough. What has happened with Black Lives Matter, it's like a, it's like a, a moment in time. It has been a catalyst for the work that people have been doing for years, for the policy mm. papers that ENA has been sponsoring, for the research that has been done. It's, it's the time for us to bring it up and say, look, we've had enough. You cannot go on murdering people and then uh, acting as, and then going around lecturing other people about how they should observe human rights. This yeah. is a breach of our human rights. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to say, I think also Black Lives Matters, as in a, a movement, does say that it's intersectional and inclusive. So we, we also need to, to think about that. And I think moving on now to a little bit of the solutions, because Nana brought up some of the kind of research and policy uh, and the briefings that we, we've we recently um, produced and published on our website. And um, again, we kind of asked you all to have a, have a look um, and at, the, at the, some of the solutions. I think it's interesting because we've talked a lot, we've covered a lot actually in this discussion. Um, and in some respects, we've talked about non-formal education. We've talked about making sure that um, institutions understand anti-racism. Um, but I think, to be honest, we've been talking about police brutality for, for many years. We've been talking about education and training and et cetera. And I think one of the things in the in the briefing is, is saying that actually, do we need to start thinking beyond these institutions? Like, what do we want as uh, communities? How do we move um, forward now? So, Nadia, I'm going to go to you first and ask you, you know, did you have any thoughts on, on some of the recommendations? And if you had anything that you thought that, that you could share with us that wasn't included there? Um, I thought that I think that it was it was it, the briefing kind of how it goes beyond speaking about education and trying to remedy the systems that we that we currently are working within and with. Um, I think that that was really great. I personally think I believe in in defunding, disbanding, and abolishing the police service. Um, I think that yeah, I've, as I've already mentioned, investment in radical community powered institutions as alternatives is the way forward. And that's kind of what I was getting from the briefing. I think that it was interesting how you drew, how how the, the paper drew f was, was written from an intersectional perspective, um, because I think that there are lots of people speaking about how maybe abolishing the police force won't be feminist because of all of these different issues. But I think that it, in fact, it is feminist to abolish the police force. And I was kind of, I was, I was impressed that you were, that you were coming from this, for writing this, this paper from such an intersectional perspective. Um, yeah, that was kind of my that was kind of my, my thoughts. I also was thinking about um I thought it was interesting reading about the bit about corona and how it and what kind of Roxana spoke about at the beginning about how it um sanctions hyper policing. But I thought it was also interesting how this is an really op an opportunity because we're normalizing for mask like wearing masks in the in the streets. And I think that it's a really cool opportunity to subvert the state's gaze. Um, because because with the police and with with hyper security and stuff, we're all being told that we need to expose ourselves at all time. All of our information, all of our bodies needs to be constantly scrutinized by the state so that they can secure life. Um, and I think that that's a small victory for for people, Muslim women, for example, who are prohibited from covering their faces in public. So I thought that was a really interesting. That was what mm -hmm. we were talking about. But other than that, no, not really. I thought it was really, really an interesting and a really good place to start, to be honest. And I thought it was a the, the timeline, um, the timeline of of steps was very, very useful. Um, and the different kind of the hierarchy, so kind of what needs to be done where in order to achieve our goal. I thought that was it was very comprehensive. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, that's quite positive feedback. And um, Roxana, did you have anything that you wanted to share on actual solutions? Well, I can only second what Nadia already has mentioned. And according to what uh, you have asked uh, us, like the solutions you already uh, collected, I can only second this as well. And I really want to second that we need to overcome uh, police as an institution as it is. Like the police thing, it is uh, it is an institution that is um, in place to protect white supremacy structures and to enforce 
um, or to protect a white property. Basically, that, and you cannot reform something that is based on on fundamental racism, on a racist ideology. You need to think so up something completely new if you want a state that is uh, living up to the uh, democratic values and rights that the European Union has set for itself and uh, that are set the Declaration of Human Rights. We have to think about this as a as society as a whole, and what we need for this is not the same people who made these uh, white supremacist institutions to think it up alone. We need representation. We need representation of black people, of intersectional personalities, of Romani people, of Jewish people, of Jewish black people. We all need them to think up how society can develop and um, come forward in the future. You know, because if we only give it to the people who brought us into this situation, the situation will only get worse and worse and worse. We have seen this here recently in the course of the whole discussion about Black Lives Matters and the death of George Floyd. And then suddenly we see panels where there's white people, only white people, not one black person, not one POC, talking about racism. This is not the solution. We don't need people who don't know anything about racism, who are lacking the minority experience to talk about something they have no clue of. Leave it to the experts. And the experts are the POC and POC people. Those are the ones who need to come up with solutions. And the others, they are only have two, two, two things they have to do. First is listen, and second, they have to fund us. They have to pay us for our expert knowledge that we bring in to reform the whole you, basically. This is what we need to do. And I think we need to figure out how to make it lawful. It should not be an option. To be anti-racist should not be an option. It should be mandatory. I can only second it. It must be monitor people in charge, people of power. It's not to be like, oh, maybe my opinion is a little bit racist, but I'm still the, I don't know, head of our commission. No, this is not how it should be. If you want to be head of something, you need to be anti-racist because our European values are anti-racist. Basically, that's it, and there should be no discussion. Sorry for being so emotional, but I really, I'm so fed up with people only talking and not not uh, taking actions, and we really need to take actions. And I think your um, your first uh, solutions that you have brought into this paper, they are really wonderful, and please defund the police. We need to defund this. You can do so much with the money of the police, and what we are putting into war, you know? Not only defund the police, but also defund the military, who are bringing, you know, the people are complaining about refugees, and how refugees coming to Europe are feeding on the racism in Europe, blah, 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 blah. But they are not defunding the military that is destroying the home countries that are bringing the refugees towards us because they are, the countries are basically a, a, a big ass field of death. Okay, so um, that's for me. Wow, okay. Um, I'm going to have to listen again to this, this recording because you packed in so much, Roxana. Um, and we only have like two more minutes left um, of this online discussion. And I'm going to you, Nana, last, but not least. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I want to ask you the same question, but I I mean, you are an, an ENA member and you're yeah, also yeah. kind of like politically involved. So, I mean, practically, as Roxana was saying, like, let's, let's stop talking about this issue. Like practically, do you have any like solutions or suggestions for us to, to kind of move to the next stage? Nana. Hello? Yeah, Hello. Missing for me. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Nana. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I don't mean the usual, I mean the city based training where community experiences are brought to the table because there's too many times victims are not heard and this is all bringing up the, the voice of the victim as the perpetrator hears it. And you know, we're in the UN decade for people of African descent, and the three pillars are recognition, uh, justice, and development. So for recognition, first of all, there has to be a recognition of what is going on. That there is, the whole system is based on, uh, the other speakers spoke of a white supremacy, uh, white is best, they know everything, and they've done the world, the world a favor. The reality we know from our experience, from our, both our lived experience and from history, that this is not true. So there needs to be a recognition of the reality. 
And then when it comes to justice, we need to look at justice right across the board, both in the past and today. There's even a petition right now about, um, we're talking about George Floyd. Well, three ex-service men in the Gold Coast were gunned down by a British colonial officer for simply marching peacefully to demand their pension. And that was 1948. They still haven't had justice. So I'll say that the, the, the ju injustice is long coming. So what you're doing is the third pillar, which is development. And in the development, we need to look at everything. Defunding the police is radical, and it's making a lot of people quake with, oh dear, this is, people don't like change. And what we've had recently in the UK is a leader of the opposition coming out and saying it's nonsense. I would rather say that he needs to sit down and listen. All very well to take the new PR stunt and say, oh, I support Black Lives Matter. But you support them until they start making demands that are more radical. And that means that we need to tackle the pillars of racism that hold up this society. So we need to tackle the institutional racism. We need to tackle the that allow people to do the things that they do. So we need to tackle all that. And whether or not we defund the police, we respond with whatever. We need to have the discussion, and it has to be a discussion with the people. And it's the communities who are facing this onslaught, and I've been facing it for years, are uh, at the table. It will bring out a new thinking. I remember my 26-year-old went on a demonstration, Black Lives Matter demonstration, with uh, some of her peers. For some of them, it was their very first demonstration. And one of the questions they asked says, oh, uh, have you ever faced racism? I mean, for somebody, and I don't like the term people of color, because white is also a color. I like us to say an African, an Asian, whatever, let's describe our, who we are. Now, she has an African child. <laughs> she might be British, but she's African. She might have pictures, but she's still an African. This African child, she actually told them, well, I live in my skin. Of course I'll face it. So her banner during the demonstration was, when this protest is over, I will still be black. And it's that. We live it. We face it. Some of us uh, are able to, to, to parry the blows. Some of us are not so lucky. I think to pretend that it's not there, to pretend that we don't need to reform or, re or radically change the system. The problem also will be some of us are suffering Stockholm Syndrome. We, in a way, identify with the oppressor. And so we want to tell people that they are being too radical or they are asking too much. I think that at this stage, there should be nothing off the table. And politicians need to listen to what the people are saying. Even radical things like defund the police, in radical things like, uh, uh, you know, attacking their sense of history. Because the way they've heard history is very, very, uh, you know, it's, it's selective. They haven't heard the whole story. You know, so they need to. I remember my old man and comrades in school saying that the OBE stands for obedient boy of the empire. And it's, it's that kind of thing. Our experience of some of the, um, how do I say, some of the trappings of uh, uh, European civilization are not that wonderful. We've seen it from another angle. And that's not to say that there weren't some good people who came along with the uh, traffickers and the, um, and the people who did horrible things. Let's also have a, a rounded history which acknowledges the good, but we need to actually call out the bad practice. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nana. I mean, we are right just over our 45 minutes. So I'm going to wrap up this discussion right now. And thank you all. Thank you definitely, Nana, Nadia and Roxana for your passionate and informed and smart solutions. And I think that if we... Um, I mean, this whole online discussion um, series has been about like us having conversations and trying to identify ways forward. And I think this this conversation was so rich with different ideas. Um, so I'm really happy that we had this conversation. I think this might be one of our last online discussions. Um, and I forgot actually to say at the beginning that we were taking comments and questions, but it's, it's too late now. Next time, if people want to comment and we can ask questions next time, but thank you very much. Um, and um, maybe we'll have one more conversation after this. And um, yes, let's stay in touch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
No, I can't leave. Thank <laughs> you. 